Buddha. <laughs> okay. I think uh, now is about time to start the session. So I'll just make, uh, so the recording will uh, start uh, soon. Yeah, has already started the um, uh, live streaming and recording. Uh, and uh, I just want to remind everyone that we're bound by the a IACR code of conduct, which means that uh, people, well, among other things, but basically means that you need to use your full professional name. So please uh, rename your uh, cells with your full professional name. Uh, right. Uh, now the, this session is on encryption schemes and secure channels, and I'll hand you to the two moderators, uh, Dario and Mark. All right, thanks, Petros. So let's just, just uh, jump right into it. We have the first presentation about memory type reductions for practical camps. The talk will by Rishiraj uh, Bhattacharai. And I hope that the screen sharing works. Okay, so let's try. Uh, I hope uh, everything is visible and I'm audible. Yes. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, I'm going to talk about memory type reductions for practical key encapsulation mechanisms. So as this is a five minute version, I'll just jump uh, straight into the results. Uh, in the paper, we talk about uh, memory type reduction uh, for the NCC security of hash tail Kamal uh, from gap defilm and assumption. So we consider two variants, namely the Kramershoe variant and the ECIES variant. Uh, our reduction works for the Kramershoe variant over all gap groups. However, for the ECIES variant, we need the underlying group to support pairing. Uh, we then extend this uh, result to different uh, modules or different variants of uh, Fujisaki Okamoto transformations. Uh, in particular, we consider the modular approach uh, from the work of uh, Hoffens, Hovermans, and Kills from TCC 2017. Uh, we show memory type reduction for uh, variants FO and FOM. Uh, both of the variants are uh, of implicit rejections. Uh, the module FO uh, is where the key derivation function hashes message and the ciphertext, and the module FOM is where the key derivation function uh, hashes only the message. Uh, we could show a memory type reduction uh, variant with explicit rejection as well. Uh, the variant was named QO4MPARP uh, by HHK. Uh, however, we uh, want the reader, that, uh, we want everyone that uh, here we are working in the classical domain. Okay, uh, so given that uh, all these uh, constructions were uh, done 20 years back and they have been analyzed again and again, why do we uh, analyze it uh, here again? And the reason is that the hardness of the problems can be memory sensitive and uh, previous approaches did not consider uh, the memory uh, consumption of the reduction into the account. So specifically, uh, what recent cryptanalytic results have shown that the more memory to adversary uh, may lead to faster attack. And this in particular implies that when we are writing uh, the hardness assumption in a concrete statement, uh, uh, there it comes up uh, an additional parameter, namely the memory. So the hardness assumption must say that the base attack will succeed with probability at most epsilon when the adversary is bounded above uh, by time t and the memory is mu. Now this automatically translates uh, to the memory efficiency of reduction. And uh, based on this line of thinking, uh, Orbach, uh, Cash, Fish and Kills in crypto 2017 introduced the notion of a memory tightness of a reduction. Roughly speaking, a reduction is memory tight if to achieve the same advantage as the original adversary, the reduced adversary uh, consumes uh, more, more or less the same amount of time and memory. Now, given that uh, now we have a memory parameter into account, uh, natural question is uh, whether we can make every reduction memory type. Unfortunately, that is not the case. In fact, most of the results in the memory type reduction are lower bounds or impossibility results. The only uh, positive results that I know of uh, is in the random oracle model. And it was proved by ACFK in their crypto 2017 paper itself. And they proved that existential unforgeability of RSA full domain hash uh, can be uh, made uh, memory, or can be achieved via memory type reduction. Uh, 
if we look closely, we can see that the, the reduction is a memory efficient version of Coron's proof. And one of the major techniques that they used was to simulate the random oracle using a PRF. Now, this technique uh, of uh, simulating uh, the random oracle using a PRF works uh, when, uh, like uh, in the case of RSA full domain hash, uh, when the reduction needs to uh, do some post processing with the random oracle output. However, in many of the cases, where the deduction need to do intricate programming uh, of the uh, random oracle, uh, the technique doesn't seem to be directly applicable. On the other hand, the standard technique of auto simulation by tabulation is uh, completely infeasible there uh, because of course uh, the deduction cannot uh, spend that much memory to uh, save the, all the queries at the table. So uh, based on this, uh, ACFK uh, raised this as an open problem to find memory type reduction of Ashtel Gamal or uh, to show that there doesn't exist one. So in this uh, work, uh, we solved this problem. We showed a memory type reduction for Ashtel Gamal in for both the variants. Uh, so what we bring to the table is a refinement of the uh, PRF uh, to simulate RO approach, what we call a map then PRF approach. And uh, how it works, uh, very uh, briefly, uh, in case of Kramoshup hash Elgamal, what we do is to puncture the PRF and then on the punctured points, uh, we define an injective map to simulate the random oracle. Uh, in case of ECIES, uh, what we apply is first we apply a pairing to go to the target group and then apply the uh, PRF. And in case of uh, general Fuisaki Okamoto transformation, we used the, we use the encryption scheme itself as the map and interestingly, uh, when we do that, if, uh, when the correctness of the encryption scheme is upper bounded, we can use the fact that a collision resistant hash function followed by a PRF is a PRF and uh, make everything, uh, make the proof go through even for the uh, encryption scheme with correctness errors. Yeah, that's it, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, maybe there'll be questions later popping up when we have all the talks. And I would suggest that we continue with the next talk. Yeah, so um, the next talk is uh, uh, toward uh, RSA OIP without random oracles by uh, Mohamed Zaheri, Nairen Kao, and Adam O'Neill. And uh, the speaker uh, today is uh, Mohamed Zaheri. And please, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm going to present two word RSAIP without random oracles. This is a joint work with Nairan Kao and Adam O'Neill. So the problem that we are trying to address in our work is uh, to see uh, how secure are these, uh, the random oracle based uh, schemes when we use it in practice and instantiate the random oracle. Uh, specifically, uh, we are looking at RSAIP. Uh, which is uh, which is a standard encryption used in uh, our uh, web browsers. Uh, there are several results uh, in the literature. We have uh, in '94 uh, uh, by Bilari and Rogway. Uh, they show that uh, RCAP is uh, IND CPA secure in random oracle model. There is a follow up work in 2001 that shows it's uh, IND CCA2 in the random oracle model. We also have a standard results. Uh, we have uh, partial instantiation of uh, T-clear uh, and also full instantiation under non-malleability non security. We also have uh, security in a standard model under IND CPA, uh, where in 2010, uh, where G is um, instantiated to be uh, T-wise independent and RSA uh, to be lossy, therefore uh, we, we can have the lossiness for a large um, E, the, uh, the exponent of RSA. Uh, but there are no, um, unfortunately there are no IND CCA security in a standard model for RSA OEP. 
Uh, what we do, we have a partial instantiation results for full RSA UAP, where we instantiate either a G or H by modeling the other one as a random oracle. And uh, this is uh, kind of an interesting results because it implies that if the adversary wants to attack the RSA UAP, it needs to find the vulnerability uh, for the interaction of the two uh, function G and H. And this is because if that, so we show if the adversary only have access to the code of G and H is a random oracle, the adversary cannot attack. And also if the adversary have the access to the code of H and G is a random oracle, the adversary cannot attack. So it means that the adversary needs to, if, to, if he wants to attack, he needs to, uh, take advantage of the interaction of the two hash functions. Uh, the results that we have here uh, are, uh, are you use the algebraic property for, properties of RSA, which I describe later. And it's, it's shown to be hold for RSA for a small exponent, for example, for E is equal to three. Uh, we also gave a full instantiation results for variants of RSA UAP, S clear and T clear. For example, for S clear, uh, for T clear, as you see, the RSA only applies on S. Uh, we uh, instantiated G and H, where G is PRG and extractable, and H is a hardcore function and extractable. And RSA should be only um, one way. Uh, we also gave a full uh, instantiation results for S clear, where uh, in our instantiation, uh, G is a PRG, so random generator and extractable. Uh, H could be any function, uh, and RSA should be uh, one way, uh, one way, and also non malleable and some sort of IND, which we describe, we introduce in our paper. Uh, the only results that we have for S clear so far in literature was just negative results. So in order to fully instantiate it, we need to make these assumptions on RSA. Uh, I only briefly go over one of our results and give a kind of a proof idea. And it's only for partial instantiation for uh, when we instantiate G and H is a random oracle. So uh, we show RSA is INDCCA secure in a random oracle model when G is a, a pseudo random generator and RSA is uh, one way and SIE and CIE. And I, I'll define what I mean by SIE and CIE. By SIE, which is uh, second input extractability, I mean if the, uh, for, uh, for any uh, C, if we know uh, most significant bits of the pre-image, uh, in this case S, there is always extractor to recover the T part. So by knowing C and S, we can use the extractor to recover the T part. Uh, by common uh, input, ex by CIE common input extractability, we mean that for any C1 and C2, which have the same S1, we could recover T1 and T2. There is an extractor that could, in polynomial time, could extract T1 and T2. And it was shown that the RSA with a small exponent have these properties. So these are not assumption on RSA if uh, exponent is a small. Um, so the proof idea is as follows. First, we uh, start with the um, kind of a uh, easy, uh, um, easy way by uh, just uh, proving INDCPA, then I will extend it to INDCCA. So we show that in INDCPA games, the, the, ad uh, the, uh, the probability of the adversary querying for S, uh, which is a pre uh, most significant bits of the pre-image uh, pre bits of uh, challenge C, that the probability of the adversary querying S uh, on H is uh, very low because if the adversary could query that, we could use the SIE extractor to 
uh, invert the RSA. So we, uh, we could see that the output of H looks random because adversary don't, uh, di did not query for S. So R is random. And when G is a PRG, the output of G is random. So the ciphertext would be independent of the bit B. So the IND CPA case is uh, uh, we could use uh, one Venus and SIE to do that. But how oh, can please, we please? Uh, so you're a bit over time. Can you please? Sure. Uh, this is the last slide. So to extend it to uh, IND CCA, we use these two extractors to uh, build the extractor EXT. So let's S be the most significant bits of challenge ciphertext and S prime be the most significant bits of the decryption oracle, decryption queries. If the adversary makes S prime to the oracle, random oracle, we could use the SIE extractor. And if the adversary query for some C prime with the S prime is equal to C, we could use SIE extractor. And otherwise we output null. So we build this extractor and we show that this extractor is successful for most, uh, most of the time. And uh, thanks very much if you have any questions. So any questions? What is, so maybe I have a question. So what is your, what is your prediction? Is OAP instantiable in the standard model or not? I mean, beyond the low exponent case. So I think it is. So um, we show uh, we show it's instantiable for S clear and T clear, fully instantiable, and we also show the partial instantiation for both of them. Uh, so it is possible, but we sh uh, kind of we were not unfortunately we were not able to uh, fully instantiate the RSAOEP itself. And would you, do you have a feeling? Is it rather possible or rather impossible? So I have these following works that I'm working on. I'm using some sort of IO and punctuated PRF, and it seems promising. But uh, with the extractable functions, yeah, I, I was not able to do that. Okay. Yeah. So there is a question by Sakib, uh, who raised his hand. So please unmute yourself and. Uh, Ask. Uh, hi, thanks. Sure. Yeah, so my question is, um, do you think your techniques can carry over to signatures, uh, specifically PSS? Or do you see some reason why that wouldn't necessarily work straight away? Uh, I'm not very sure, but uh, extractability kind of allow us to uh, answer to the decryption oracles, maybe for signatures. Uh, it might be possible, but I'm not sure. OK, thanks. Yeah. So other question from Thomas? Thomas, do you want yes. to say? Yeah, hello. Hi. Uh, so in your theorem, when you say that you prove uh, in CCA security, uh, is it the in CCA2 or is it in CCA1? It's CCA2. CCA2. Okay, yes. thank you. Yeah, sure. And one more question by Sven. Um, yeah. So uh, I think there are some proofs in the random oracle for, um, for this scheme that shows that it actually fulfills some stronger notions like key dependent security or selective mm -hmm. opening security. Do you think, well, so, so do these these techniques that you use kind of kind of also transfer in that direction or is it like very far off still? Uh, for selective opening security, so is it in the random oracle or fully in CNC? Fully in CNC? Uh, I think in it's her? just in, in the random oracle. Random. Programmability is quite quite useful. Yeah, yeah, quite uh, yeah. So I'm not. Uh, it's not easy to see how can we extend that one because here we use uh, for full instantiation we use extractability to do the decryption oracles with random oracle it's easier to handle the decryption oracle so yeah okay thanks thank you
All right. So if there are no more questions for this talk, then we or you still have time later to ask questions, of course. Uh, then we proceed to the next talk. It's about public key punctual encryption, modular and compact construction. This is a work by Shi Feng Sun, Amin Saksa, Ron Steinfeld, Joseph Yu, and Davi Hu. Shi Feng will give the talk. And hear you. Did you unmute yourself? You think? Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, can you see the screen? Yep. Works. Okay. Uh. Um. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh. Today, I'm printing our work. Presenting our work. Uh. Um, uh. Public key punctual encryption module and uh. uh compact constructions. Uh, this is a journal work with uh, Amin Saksa, Ron Stanfield, uh, Joseph Liu from National University and uh, Dao Gu from Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Uh, informally, public key punctual encryption is like uh, an ordinary public in encryption, except that it additionally includes a puncture algorithm. Uh, by running the puncture algorithm uh, uh, repeatedly and, and sequentially, we will get a punctured secret key uh, for a set of texts. With the punctured secret key, uh, we can still uh, recover the messages encrypted and uh, none, of the, uh, none of this text, uh, but can never decrypt the subtext generated and any of uh, this text. Uh, in this work, we focus on its CAM version, uh, PCAM for short. Uh, we propose a, a modular construction of PCAM uh, based on a refined form of identity-based uh, revocable encryption. In contrast to previous works, uh, our module can construction uh, uh, supports a bounded number of uh, uh, bounded number of punctures, uh, multi-text per message, and uh, uh, negligible correctness error. Uh, we, we also give some instantiations um, uh, that uh, ingest some additional uh, features like the compact uh, subtest, uh, compact public key, or uh, Unbounded number, unbounded um, number of text per message. Uh, before showing our approach, uh, uh, let's first recall the notion of identity-based revocable uh, CAM. In an identity-based uh, revocation system, uh, uh, when a user uh, wants to broadcast a message to the system and uh, would not like some specific users to uh, Access this message. Uh, she will she will generate an encapsulated key and a ref, uh, revocation list containing those specific users. Uh, the user not contained in the revocation list uh, can use his uh, derived from a trusted authority to uh, uh, recover the encapsulated key, uh, while others cannot. Uh, now let's turn to our uh, introduce our approach. Uh, our approach uh, starts from the ob observation that uh, a PCAM supporting for only one puncture can be derived straightforwardly from uh, any RCAM. Uh, our essential idea is to make it support multi punctures by distributing the ability to uh, recover the in encapsulated key across all punctures. Uh, so, uh, the key generation algorithm and the uh, enca encapsulation algorithm of our uh, PCAM uh, are identical to those of uh, AirCAM uh, schemes. Uh, as just mentioned, our essential idea is to uh, distribute the ability of recovering the encapsulated key uh, across all punctures. Uh, to do so, uh, we assume that uh, the encapsulated key is a uh, uh, it's, a it's a function of the secret master secret key and uh, the random coins are used in the encapsulation, encapsulation algorithm. Uh, further, we assume that the function is uh, homomorphic with, with, with respect to uh, ASCII. Uh, in this case, uh, the encapsulated key can be split into uh, as many shares as the number of punctures. Uh, all these uh, MS keys uh, are used 
for carrying out uh, punctures during the uh, puncture procedure. Uh, uh, each MSK is for uh, one puncture. Uh, particularly, uh, whenever carrying uh, out to, uh, a puncture at a new tech, uh, we will choose uh, a fresh master secret key and use it to uh, conduct this puncture. Uh, exactly uh, to puncture uh, the initial uh, secret key SK0 at tech T1, we will choose a, 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 a choose randomly a master secret key MSK1 and use it to generate a corresponding a private key SKT1 by running the key extraction algorithm of ACM. Uh, similarly, we can choose another master secret key and use it to uh, puncture the current secret key SK1 uh, at tag T2 and get the puncture secret key for tag T1 and T2. Uh, by repeating this process, uh, we can get a puncture secret key for a, a set of tags. Uh, to decrypt uh, a soft test with a punctured secret key CSKA for uh, text T1 to TI, uh, we hope that the decapitalization algorithm of, of ARCAM can be still used to uh, recover the uh, encapsulated key shares uh, from uh, the corresponding private key and the soft test. Uh, if the tag associated with the private key uh, belongs not to the set of tags attached to the soft test. Uh, uh, we call such kind of our camp schemes uh, extend correct. Uh, then by the comorphic property of uh, F, then okay. we can recover the- You're already over time. Oh, sorry, uh, uh, last slice. Uh, with this, uh, with uh, our camp with uh, satisfying these properties, we, ca we, uh, we uh, get our generic construction following uh, the above approach. Uh, regarding securities can be uh, reduced to that of the underlying outcome scheme without additional, uh, that's it. Thank you. Thanks. Any questions and post on the chat or raise your hand? Thank you, none. On the overview slide you had, um, all the schemes you described had one uh, non-compact field, like either the public key or the secret key or the, the ciphertext, I think. Um, that was one of your, one of your first slides. Uh, yeah. Slide number five. Is this, is this inevitable? Do you always have to have some non-compact part? Yeah, yeah, uh, for the third, con uh, third construction, the soft test is not compact. But is there a fundamental reason why this has to be the case? Or do you, do you hope that- I, I, th I think it is uh, uh, really hard to achieve uh, uh, compact uh, public key, secret key, and soft test at the same time. Uh, actually, our, our constructions are just derived from some uh, existing uh, identity-based verification schemes. Uh, so it's uh, it uh, uh, highly relies on the properties of uh, the underlying RCAM scheme. If there is a, an RCAM scheme satisfy, uh, I mean, uh, having uh, uh, all compact uh, parameters, then of course, if it is additionally satisfy the uh, comorphic property and uh, extended correctness, uh, uh, then um, the the PCAM derived from this ARCAM will uh, uh, have uh, all compact par parameters. So I see no more questions or raised hands. So I think we can continue to the next talk. Yes, uh, so the next talk is on the flexible authenticated and confidential channel establishment, FACC, analyzing the noise protocol framework. Uh, it's a work by Mindoli, Paul Rosler, and George Bank, and the speaker is Paul. Yes, thank you. I hope you can hear me and see me, uh, or at least my slides. Um, so we will, or I talk about uh, channel establishment and uh, as it was introduced, this is joint work with Benjamin Dowling and Jörg Schwenk and Ben is from ETH Zurich. 
So we talk about channel establishment and in particular, we talk about the noise protocol framework and the noise protocol framework can be thought of as a toolbox from which one can derive and obtain single uh, channel establishment protocols, which we call patterns in this work and which is also called patterns in uh, the noise protocol framework, which is or has been initially de uh, de um, developed and is still developed by Trevor Perrin. And due to the uh, lightweight building blocks that this uh, framework uses, and also due to the modular and extendable uh, structure of uh, this framework, it is already used in many uh, wide uh, deployed or widely deployed uh, applications that protect communication every day. Um, in contrast to, for example, TLS, it is or it can currently only be used within uh, situations or settings in which all entities that use the framework um, uh, agree upon the same set of parameters. So there is no kind of new parameter neg negotiation. And what we did in our work is we analyzed uh, eight out of these 15 base patterns. So eight of, out of these 15 base protocols and Jim did not, uh, I don't hear it either. Oh, I'm so sorry. Sorry, I will down level my volume. I hope it's better now. I don't know. It's fine. Okay, I'll see. Okay, uh, so what we did is we analyzed eight out of these 15 base patterns. Um, and there are, as I said, many extensions. There has been uh, work on this previously. Uh, so in a symbolic model, uh, automatically Kobayashi et al. Um, analyzed uh, almost all patterns that can be defined in this uh, noise protocol framework. And also in computational models, there have been analyses of single patterns, uh, uh, more precisely the wire guard uh, pattern, um, on the one hand manually by Dowling and Patterson, and also automatically by Lip et al. last year at EuroSCP. Okay, so to give you an idea what these patterns look like, I will now introduce three of these patterns from this noise protocol framework. And uh, what they do is um, they have a handshake phase and a channel phase. And when, within the handshake phase, the end pattern, this is the first one that I show here, uh, the initiator A sends a, a diffie hellman chair in addition to an AEAD ciphertext with a key that is derived from the uh, ephemeral diffie hellman chair of A and the long-term Diffie-Hellman share D to the capital B uh, of the responder B. And already within this handshake message, a payload M0 is sent from initiator to responder. So this end pattern can only be used for unidirectional communication from initiator to responder, and it does not authenticate any party. So as I said, after the handshake, channel messages can follow encrypted under the same key with some different uh, associated data within the AEAD ciphertext. The NK pattern then additionally adds a second handshake message back from responder B to initiator A. And what it does is it contains an, an ephemeral G to the B as the Diffie-Hellman share from the responder. And this uh, Diffie-Hellman share is then also mixed into the keys used for encrypting both handshake messages and channel messages. And finally, we see the XK pattern here, which just adds a third and a fourth cipher checks from initiator A to responder B. And so what we see here is at the end, both initiator A and responder B are authenticated. And uh, also we have forward uh, secrecy because both ephemeral Diffie-Hellman shares are used. Um, but this is not the case, for example, for the first pattern. So we see here, there are multiple different uh, security properties for multiple uh, different protocols, but they are kind of similar. So the question that we try to uh, answer in our work is apart from analyzing these patterns, how to analyze all these patterns within uh, that reach different security guarantees at different points during the protocol execution in a computational model that allows for um, comparing all our analy uh, analyze, um, analysis results. So what we did kind of in contrast to previous work is we ignored uh, everything that regards the key establishment within the construction in our model and try to model only the actual functionality of uh, noise frame or noise patterns, which is the channel. So we looked at messages that are encrypted. 
Plus, we also looked at a security level output that kind of in, um, says towards uh, the environment, okay, for this message encrypted now through the channel, the certain security or these specific security uh, guarantees are reached. Uh, so what we looked at is, or what this means is kind of if we param parameterize our model and, um, no, so, sorry. We parameterize our model with uh, several parameters uh, regarding authentication, forward secrecy, and uh, other properties. And what it means is the construction outputs a security level, and then the model looks, okay, is this security level that is indicated by the construction really reached? If yes, then the uh, construction is secure, otherwise it is insecure. And what we then did is we looked uh, in our analysis at eight out of these 15 uh, patterns from the noise framework and we gave specifically the stages at which they reach authentication, forward secrecy, replay attack resistance and other properties also in an extended, in an extended version. And um, so to give you an idea for the patterns that I introduced at the beginning of the talk, you see here that the end pattern reaches neither authentication nor replay attack resistance nor forward secrecy. The NK pattern uh, reaches not authenticity of the uh, initiator, uh, whereas the XK pattern then at the third stage reaches this property. Okay, so roughly uh, uh, summarized in our work, we introduce uh, or look at the noise protocol framework. We um, analyze and provide a security model for channel establishment, uh, which we think is useful also for further analyses of channel establishments in general, uh, because we overcome several drawbacks from previous work. And uh, we then precisely derive security properties for eight out of these 15 base patterns from the noise framework. And in the extended talk uh, or in the full talk on YouTube, uh, I also discuss some properties of our security model. The work is available on ePrint and you can contact me for questions or ask right now. Thank you very much for your attention. So questions for Paul? So I have a, a short one. Uh, okay, yeah, uh, go ahead, Marco. You, you can. Now I see. Uh, you should unmute yourself. I see, I saw, yeah. so I thought you asked first. So um, I was wondering about the um, assumptions on the key um, key derivation function if you have multiple secrets as input? Uh, yeah, we use uh, the PRF OD, so various dif uh, different variants of the PRF ODA, uh, ODH assumption uh, in order to, because sometimes it's not necessary to have both inputs, uh, so both uh, kind of the symmetric chaining key and the Diffie-Hellman key exchanges both uh, secure for deriving or for reaching the specific security guarantees. So at the, as a result in our work, we have multiple uh, variants of the PRF ODH assumption. And use them and base our proofs on them. Okay, thanks. So my question said is if you can say like, a couple of words about um, which other confidential channel esta uh, establishing fair, uh, protocols you're thinking to uh, about applying your framework to. Um, so actually, we don't have other currently in mind. Um, but um, as new channel establishment protocols uh, come up from from real world. So usually it's not uh, uh, our science that produces new ther theoretic ideas for channel establishment, but usually some people from reality think that it could be useful to come up with a new channel establishment. And what we saw in the past is that these new channel establishment try to be very performant, have high efficiency, and especially allow for transmission of messages very early. Um, this makes it uh, problematic to analyze these channel establishment uh, protocols with traditional or previous models because they do not allow for uh, the, the transmission of early messages. This also holds for usual uh, key exchange uh, analysis, uh, analysis for these handshake phases because uh, as we know from uh, comp uh, composability results, we cannot use the key 
for which we want to show security uh, uh, within the key exchange itself. So I think the overall ideas that we overcome from previous work and that we produce in our work from our model can help for future channel establishments to be analyzed. But as I said, I don't have uh, particular um, uh, protocols in mind currently. Thanks. So yeah, there are no more Thank questions. Thank you very much. I think we can uh, move ahead. Okay, so next up is uh, privacy pre preserving key exchange in the case of IKE version two. I think Sven, this is the work by Sven Schäger, Jörg Schwenk, Sebastian Lauer, and Sven will give the talk. Can you hear me, guys? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so let's start. So thanks for the introduction. So I'm going to give a quick overview of our, our um, result on privacy preserving authenticated key exchange and the application to IPsec to more concretely to IKEY um, version two. Okay. Um, so while in classical key exchange, you consider Alice having uh, key pairs uh, a key pair, a secret key, and a public key, and Bob, uh, and and Bob as well. So, in but well, in practice, you you quite often also um, you have to consider situations in which at least one of them has um, more than two cryptographic keys. For example, in multi-home servers, where you have a physical server machine, a single one, and on that server machine you run virtual servers that uh, Alice can communicate with. So in this case, you could like, you could say that uh, Bob is, uh, is having, well, two secret keys and um, Alice can access Bob with two public keys. Mm -hmm. But you might also consider the more general case where each of the parties has several identities. Now, of course, well, this is key exchange you, you want secure, you want to secure your, your messages with the um, derived symmetric key, um, you need key indistinguishability as well, right? So as in the classical setting, but you might also want to consider um, privacy in the following sense, in the sense that um, communication where Alice tries to connect to, to, to Bob's first public key is indistinguishable from communication when Alice tries to connect to um, Bob's second public key. Okay, so and this setting has been considered before, uh, but so what we are doing here is uh, so let's first talk to, oh, talk about the motivation. Of of course, this is privacy, right? So you want to have some privacy, but uh, what is also quite useful and turn, turned out uh, to be um, a major um, a major issue is that using the identifying information that Alice sends over to select Bob's, um, their Bob's public key, Bob's um, their communication identity may allow for effective censorship, right? So there are some large scale censorship mechanisms on the internet where based on, um, on Alice choice that is usually, con usually transferred in the clear, uh, there's, there's actual censorship. Okay, so those two are the main reasons to do this stuff. Um, okay, so the results of this paper is the, the result of this paper is a, is a, first of all a very general model for for what we call privacy preserving AKE. And what this model really emphasizes is that um, you should have cryptographic independence between the notions. What I mean by that is and this has not been considered uh, before. What I mean by that, that it's, it's, it's really essential that even though you leak some um, identity information, you might still have in your security proof, in your security model, you might still have um, key indistinguishability. And this is in particular because, well, in reality, um, identity-based information 
um, they they do um, occur in in context information as well, right? So they are while well, a cryptographic key is is chosen ad hoc after some diffie hellman key exchange, and it's it's supposed to be a random looking value, but identity related information are typically uh, also leakable uh, via some other techniques, via some other um, levels that are not considered in cryptographic models. So there should be some cryptographic independence, even though in the security model, you leak the identity, there, there, there still should be um, key indistinguishability. And we actually require the opposite as well. So we require that those two, those two security notions are cryptographically independent. So it's, it's actually, so we are not trying to, to invent the model. So what we do is we, um, we give some ingredients how to enhance existing models. And well, there's using our work, you have to change, um, you have to extend the variables of the sessions and uh, also the attack capabilities, but it basically should work for, for every other model as well. So you could also apply that to ACCE, for example, or unilateral communication or whatever, right? So, and why do we do that? Because, well, comparing models in key change is really hard to do because there are so many and picking like two random models will, will have probably with high, with overwhelming probability have them to be incomparable. So what we want to do is we want to um, construct models that are proper um, extensions. So then there's another contribution and a new feature. And this feature is, is called modes. And what this does is, is that, well, with modes, we encode the expectations of every session of who is going to be responsible for choosing identities. So Alice thinks she is, she is going to choose the identity of Bob, but maybe Bob is also expecting himself to choose his own identity. And with that concept, we try to, to allow the attacker to, to make sessions clash that have distinct expectations, right? Okay, and finally, we provide a proof for uh, signature-based authentication of, of iKey version two. And I guess the take home message is that, well, there, there is a proof, but in general, one, one, one might encounter some problems because of circularities. Um, so in a nutshell, there is some anonymous Diffie-Hellman key exchange that gives some that gives some symmetric key, and this symmetric key is used to encrypt all the information that follows, in particular authentication information. So you need to really be careful here because the authentication information helps you to show that the the key of the anonymous key exchange is secure, but the key again is used to kind of hide the information that is transferred via, via the authentication mechanism. But luckily for, for signature-based authentication in IQ version two, this has worked out quite well. And another take home message is maybe that um, in contrast to usually keen distinguishability, but I mean, this is very natural. You have to consider identity dependent information. Do you have to ensure that the, the length of that information uh, does not reveal anything about their identities, of course, right? So um, using different signature schemes for different identities may be problematic. You have to, to use other means as well. So that's all. Thank you very much. Thanks. Questions? No questions on the chat. No one raising hand. And given that we're probably close to finish time anyway, I would suggest that we just keep on moving to the next. Yes. <clears throat> so um, the next talk is on uh, uh, limits on the efficiency of Ring LWE based non interactive key exchange um, by CEO Guo, British Kamat, Alon Rosen, and uh, Katerina Sotiraki. And, uh, Katerina is the speaker today. So, okay, we already see your screen. Uh, Hi, is yours. I hope, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. So uh, let me start the brief overview of our paper. 
Um, so the topic of the talk is LWV-based key exchange. Then there are two types of um, uh, key exchange based on LWV. The ones that uh, uh, are based on public encryptions and the ones uh, through reconciliation. The ones uh, through reconciliation is the main focus of uh, this talk. So let me give you a brief overview of uh, how this protocol would look like. So we have Alice and Bob and they share uh, metrics A. And then each one of them uh, picks some uh, LWE secrets and they exchange LWE samples. And notice that um, Alice left multiplies uh, A with her, sample, with her secret, whereas Bob uh, right multiplies. And then uh, by taking the inner product with the secrets, they can compute, they can compute these two quantities. And notice that um, these two quantities are very close to each other. So after one round, they already have a approximate uh, key agreement. Then in uh, reconciliation-based protocols, uh, we have an extra round where X information is uh, leaked. And uh, this uh, allows us to go from uh, an approximate agreement to exact agreement. The question that we are trying to address is whether this interaction is inherent. And uh, our first observation is that um, in the case that uh, these noises are very small compared to two, then interaction is not necessary because we can just uh, round off uh, the noise and get uh, the exact uh, agreement on x1, ax2. However, this uh, result is not, uh, uh, is not fine uh, for many reasons. Uh, first of all, in practice, q has to be small, so we are not in this regime. And also, if we have uh, this, uh, then the modulo between uh, noise and uh, the ratio between modulo and noise is small, then we get the worst uh, security guarantees. So um, our actual question is whether we can have a non-directive LW-based agreement when Q is small. And our result can be summarized uh, through the following uh, sentence. Uh, so natural ide ideas for achieving non-directive exchange do not work. So let me summarize our, our two impossibility results. So the first one is whether we can amplify the agreement probability by repetition. So namely, instead of uh, just exchanging one LW samples, now the parties exchange many LW samples, and they, they take the inner product, so they have this uh, approximately equal values. And the question is whether they can run a reconciliation function on this approximately equal value to get uh, an exact uh, key agreement. Our theorem says that this is impossible. In fact, uh, uh, no matter what functions they run, their agreement would always be bounded away from one. Uh, here, it is impossible to amplify with repetition. Uh, an important notion in this that we use in this uh, impossibility is what is called maximal correlation. And this is a notion from uh, information theory that uh, exactly captures the agreement probability in this model, uh, even when the players have infinite number of samples. And actually, the lemma that we use from information theory is that uh, if the maximal correlation is bounded away from one, then uh, repetition does not help. For our second possibility, we consider more general reconciliation functions, where they not only depend on uh, this approximate uh, uh, on this approximate equal values, but uh, in general on along the input of uh, the parties. Uh, and we consider cases where, for one, at least one of them, in this case, analysis the reconciliation function does not depend on its noise, and we call such reconciliation functions noise ignorance. Uh, our result says that if uh, the LWV assumption holds, then it is impossible to have the agreement in when at least one of the reconciliation function is noise ignorant. So let me summarize the two impossibility result. The first one is information theoretic and basically says that uh, we cannot amplify agreement by repetition. And the second one is computational based on the learning with error assumption. And it says that it's impossible to have noise ignorant reconciliation function. And uh, both of our results extend to the case of ring LWE. Also, we complement our results with uh, some other connections. In particular, we show that uh, it is possible to have non-interactive agreement based on IO plus LWE. And this is uh, basically a generalization of the ponens on the result. So a uh, general impossibility in our model seems implausible. Also, we show that uh, a non-directive key agreement based on the polynomial modular LWV would give a direct construction of a weak PRF based, again, on polynomial modular LWV. And uh, let me conclude so, with some open directions. So uh, one direction is uh, whether we can construct actually non-directive key agreement based on polynomial modular LWV. And the other one is whether we can uh, get more general impossibility. 
Thank you for listening to my talk and I'll be happy to answer any questions. So questions, anyone? Oh, yes, there is one by Sven. Sven, go ahead. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, do these results also hold for um, for mechanisms that are based on learning with rounding? Basically, yes, because uh, this is, I, I think that yes. Yeah. Because this is um, what would be the trivial thing to do, right? It says that there is no reconciliation function, and one reconciliation function would be the just rounding function. Yeah, I mean, like the uh, so it might be just that there is no that the rounding function needs to be deterministic or probabilistic, but there's no need for that, no obvious need, right? Mm, sorry, can you repeat? So, learning with rounding, you can kind of view round, learning with rounding with a very special um, yeah, error function, I guess, that is deterministic. So, but you do not need that the that the arrow is 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 kind of probabilistic then, right? So this, it it works through. There's there's no problem, from your perspective. I mean, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Does anyone else have a question for Katerina? Okay. So if not, we can move to the last talk. Okay, and the last talk is about takes, new framework, new techniques, more efficient letter space constructions in the standard model. This is a joint work by Xiao Quan Jiang, Guang Gong, Jin Jian He, Hua Nibian, and Hua Xiong Wang. And Xiao Quan will give the talk. Yeah, thank you. I'm in sharing the screen. Yeah, thanks. So uh, this work we are talk about the PAICS, uh, the framework and the, the realization. So it's, it's just a summary talk. Oh, one moment, yes. Yeah. So then, then we propose a new framework for the uh, password authenticated key exchange. So the basic uh, problem we want to solve is that this uh, new fork should be secure in standard model and uh, doesn't require the CCS secure uh, encryption and uh, probably some variants. So this uh, CCS secure encryption seems it, it to be uh, essential in the previous work. So we realized that our framework in the under the learning with error, error W or something, and uh, the learning with error over ring, uh, ring error W or something respectively. So the both cases we have the, pro pro the two protocol for this, for the new framework. So the it turns out that the realization uh, much uh, more efficient than previous uh, uh, large based solutions with a standard model. And the yeah, so so the basic uh, ingredient for the framework it has three. So one is uh, one message k reconciliation, and second is the new notion of the k fuzzy message authentication code, and the last one is a uh, uh, modified uh, uh, approximate smooth project for hashing. That's modified from previous solutions. So for the uh, one message key reconciliation, so the basic problem is that Alice has a secret D, and that's uh, we consider that D is uniformly random from a set, and the Bob has um, a secret D prime that's close to D under some distance measure, and uh, we for in our work. We propose a new one message uh, scheme with D from the ZQ, whereas Q is, um, uh, is a prime. 
and it could uh, it could be it could be a, 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 that with the, the, the Q is a plan, so could be any any number in fact, and uh, that the reconciliated key has the entropy at least uh, this log Q over six delta, and uh, this delta is a uh, the arrow bound. So we also show in the information circuit, we use the information theory tool, we show the upper bound for this entropy. For any round of protocol, that means not just the one message, for any round of the protocol is at most is log Q over 2D. So the gap from the hour protocol from uh, between the hour protocol and the upper bound is at most the three bits. So if delta is, um, uh, has water less than Q, so the, the skin is uh, asymptotically optimal. So, so this is uh, for my message key reconciliation. So second uh, tour is that a key fuzzy message authentication code. So for this uh, lotion, so we basically require this uh, message authentication code is just as a normal Authenticating code, but it has uh, an additional property that if the receiver doesn't have the exactly key, he has a key that's slightly different different from the sender's uh, authenticating code key. So then, in this case, so the receiver still can verify the MAC. That means uh, he can accept a normally uh, authenticating code and also reject or tackle the forgery. So that means, the, uh, so um, our main uh, contribution here is that uh, we, we propose a lightweight uh, uh, this uh, K, KF Mac uh, with one-time security. Uh, Why well, we only consider one-time security because this is enough for our uh, framework. So the last tour is uh, approximated uh, uh, smooth projective hashing. So this uh, has uh, two hash functions. So this uh, uh, lotion has two hash function, h and h hat. And uh, this both function is built uh, over the commitment skin. So what's uh, is this uh, um, approximate smooth projective hashing? <coughs> For H, if you are given an input, a secret input a K, and a input a, the pi, and, and a, a Y, that uh, in fact, this is from the commitment space. So the projective hashing is H of K pi Y. Then if Y is a commitment of pi with weightless tau, so that means in this case, so this hash, projective hash can also can be approximated by the H hat function using tau and alpha k. Here, alpha k <coughs> is a proxy projecting key. That's uh, a function. You can just think as a function of k. You don't be bothered how to define this alpha k. So the, so this work we define with these two types of uh, uh, ASPH. So this ASPH, in fact, has a regular properties. So you, you can you can know from the uh, well-known paper as a smooth uh, property, of course. <clears throat> Basically, they has a new property, but this uh, the first type of property has uh, ASPH has a new property. This is uh, we call the is strong for smoothness. In this case, if y if y and the tau is a <coughs> is a random commitment of the secret pi, so given the random key k, so the this h the tolerative hash the h hat of tau and alpha k will be computationally independent of pi y and alpha k. So this, uh, <coughs> uh, 
has uh, this strong simplicity is uh, doesn't uh, is not occurred before. So <clears throat> sorry. So the second one is uh, second type of uh, this uh, um, uh, skin is uh, has a new property is called a uh, trapdoor generation uh, property. In this type of ASPH, so the the commitment has a trapdoor generation algorithm for the commitment key. So that in, in which case, if you have a trapdoor key, so if you can verify whether y is a commitment of a pi or not, just using the trapdoor, uh, you, you, you don't have to use a weighted so, uh, for the commitment. So you can directly verify. So this is uh, the ASPH, this two <coughs> type of um, protocol. Uh, uh, this uh, mechanism. So our result is uh, we uh, implemented this two uh, ASPH from LWE and the ring FWE uh, respectively. For the type A um, AS, ASPH, that's uh, why we define two type of, because the type A ASPH can be Oh, One more two time. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, so we'll be finished just uh, with this slide. So we'll be computationally more efficient than the, than the type B SPH. So our realization, this other boundary will be just a log given, log given um, factor, where the N is just a regular LWE or ring LWE parameter. So so also this of the advantage uh, comes from the fact the basically why we has, has this advantage because type A AS, ASPH doesn't require or trap the generation. So also this uh, uh, type A ASPH is uh, uh, applied to the authentication in the peak. So this becomes the main source. That's why it's more efficient than the previous CCA secure based authentication. So that's that's all for the talk. All right, thank you. Thanks. Any questions for this talk, or maybe we have a few moments left for any of the previous talks. I know that, for example, Marco had a question for the first talk. Uh, oh, let me see. I had a question to Katarina. Maybe in and, and then I can dig out the first question it's so long ago. Uh, so Katarina, I had a question, what is the fundamental difference between a, a public key encryption based um, approach and the reconciliation based approach? Because I somehow thought that with, you can also use reconciliation to build like a public key scheme, but I'm not an expert in this area. No, uh, so uh, in public key version, so one of the uh, one of the parties uh, picks a public key, sends it to the other one, and the other one picks the, the common secret and sends it back, right? So this, uh, this type of protocols are inherently interactive. You cannot make them non-interactive. Whereas in the reconciliation phase, it might be possible. Like there are a lot of barriers and this is what we saw, but um, there, it's not inherent that it has to be interactive. Okay, yeah, that makes sense because in a public key one, you can build a public key one from a reconciliation based one by sending like the, rec the first reconcil reconciliation message as part of the public key. So that was kind of my mm -hmm. intuition, but that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, only if the, uh, if the reconciliation base has this, this uh, type of uh, interaction, like one party sends one message that the other one responds with another message and then they run the reconciliation functions, then yes, it's the same. Mm -hmm. Cool, thanks. Any other questions? Any of the talks? I have a quick question on the second talk for Mohamed. Um, so in, uh, um, in your assumptions, the SIE and CIE, uh, can you say something about the length of S and T? So do you have some specific requirements on, on those? I don't remember exactly, but for uh, the exponent to be three, I think for you have to know two thirds of the pre-image bits. 
to recover the one the one third I and see. the fact that g is so it's like uh, s is two third and t is one third of yes. the i see if e is uh, greater then the length should be greater and yeah that's okay more questions so i remembered my first question um so it was about oap so I was wondering, it's quite a nice result, but I was wondering whether it has practical implications for, for the use in standards or, or anything you can think of in terms of like practical impact. Yeah, so uh, the practical impact for partial instantiation is that because we partially instantiate both of them, it just show that the, ad, the kind of like make the adversaries work harder because it shows that just knowing G and H is not enough. And there should be some uh, vulnerability from the interaction. And for the other one, for S clear, we have a full instantiation. So maybe, uh, but we use some kind of a strong assumptions. So uh, for example, extractability. So it's not very, maybe it's not, it's not efficient to use extractability in a full instantiation results. I see that Sakib wants to ask a question, right? Uh, yeah, just to uh, sort of follow up on Dario's question. Uh, these S and T are, are the bounds, essentially the classic Coppersmith's bounds yes. that you get out of there. OK. Yes, so it's yes. just E minus yeah. 1 over E. The... And for the other partial instantiate, we have to kind of extend these results. Uh-huh. Yeah. OK, good. Thank you. More questions? Oh, ben Benjamin? Uh, hi, I have a question maybe for Sven Schäg and Paul Rössler at the same time. I was wondering if the this identity protecting privacy notion could easily be added into the FACCE framework because it kind of is another property of um, intermediate messages, if they protect the public key or not? Um, so we've been thinking about adding some privacy preserving properties to our model, but as all of those who read our paper already uh, know that the model is already very complex, I don't know how far or how, how useful it is to uh, add more properties right away. I unfortunately didn't read uh, Sven's paper yet, so uh, I can't say anything about that. But in general also, uh, especially for analyzing noise, it would be interesting to have more uh, privacy properties being uh, considered because this is something that noise particularly tries to achieve. So I feel that uh, <clears throat> the uh, the construction idea is actually to 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 use uh, those uh, mechanisms to extend any model. I think it's there's there, there's no immediate obstacle to that. I think it's the mechanisms are quite simple and they shouldn't interfere with anything that is typically present in a model. So at at first glance, of course, and I think there should be some way to transfer the, the security models, the, the attack capabilities, and also um, the extensions of the execution environment. So that is a yes for me at first glance. OK, thank you both. OK, okay. thanks. Uh, I think we, time is over for the session. So let's thank all the speakers. And uh, yeah, I uh, think Agelos is taking over. Or... Yes, but applause for everyone. Mm. Um, all right, so actually I'm passing it to Petros to announce what's gonna happen next. Okay, we don't need that many people <laughs> to make this announcement, but okay. Uh, yeah, so basically now we will um, start the social hour, which basically, uh, 
people that are here will be allocated to random uh, smaller rooms. And uh, yeah, so uh, please stay on and uh, you'll be assigned a smaller room uh, very soon. Yeah, so to explain a bit more what's going to happen, uh, so as Pedro said, you're going to find yourself in a smaller room where uh, discussions on the first day uh, is going to happen. So you're going to see an invitation, please take it, uh, then let, let's, see, let's see what happens. If you need any help, you can ask one of the hosts, so there's a special function in Zoom that you can do that. Um, 